you know, it happens every time. During courtship, we look at our prospective spouse through perfection colored glasses. And then after the wedding, we switch to reality colored glasses. We suddenly realize, much to our shock and surprise, that the person we married isn't perfect. And we set out to answer the most important question in marriage. How can two imperfect people become one? Solomon and Shulamith went through that process too. And as we continue in our series, what the Bible says about love, marriage, and sex, we'll see how they handled the conflicts that inevitably arise when two imperfect people join hands for a lifetime. If you'll join me for the message, The Quest for the Perfect Mate, you'll learn some helpful things about living with your imperfect partner. It's straight ahead on today's edition of Turning Point. Time Magazine did a cover story on the science of romance. Perhaps you saw it. If their statistics are correct, there are now nearly 1,000 online matchmaking sites with a combined total annual revenue of $649 million. Of the 92 million unmarried Americans 18 years old and older counted in the census last year, 16 million of them have tried online dating. And that's despite the reported 66% of internet users who believe that online dating is dangerous. Love is a lucrative, recession-proof business. <laughs> Everybody is interested in love. And we've been following the romance of the Old Testament couple Solomon and Shulamith, and while they didn't have the advantage of the internet, they seem to be doing quite well. As we reconnect with their story, they're still in the courtship part of their relationship. When we last left them, they were in Solomon's palace, and Shulamith was being introduced to the royalty scene. Now the scene has shifted, and they are now back in the country, in Shulamith's house, if you will. Their wedding is just a few days away, and they are still trying to learn as much about each other as possible. Shulamith is totally head over heels in love with Solomon, but she's still observing. She's still trying to learn what she can, trying to determine how it would be to, to live with this great, powerful man. Perhaps she can still not believe that she's going to be his wife. Her mind is filled with questions. And in essence, this section of Scripture for all of us here today is sort of a tutorial on the kinds of questions that ought to be asked and answered before marriage takes place. In some respects, these questions will continue to be asked and continue to be answered throughout marriage. There are four of them here with some sub-questions under each of them. And let's go through them. And not only keep up with the story of Solomon and Shulamith, but apply these things to ourselves as well. From the pastor right down to the young person who's contemplating someday getting married, the Lord willing. First question, does he spend time with you? And we'll phrase these questions as if they were all related to Solomon, although there is some interchange here between the two of them. Does he spend time with you? Sub-question, is he excited about you? Song of Solomon 2.8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Solomon is pictured here as walking through the mountain terrain between Jerusalem and Shunem, where the Shulamite lived. He is dancing and leaping and jumping, and all I could think of when I read these words this week were, the hills are alive with the sound of music. <laughs> Solomon is coming for her. So let me ask you a question. This person you are thinking of spending your life with, do they seem excited about you? Isn't it interesting that we all kind of come to marriage through our own personality types, and there are some people, some laid-back people, 
who get married like it was the next appointment on their schedule. <laughs> but most people, even those kind of folks, when it comes to marriage, it's a pretty exciting thing. You know, I, I have memories of not being able to eat very much the week before we got married and being nervous and being excited. And, is that true? You know, this, the statement I'm making has got a counterpart to it, and that is, if there isn't any excitement about your marriage going into it, you might be headed into a pretty difficult life. Here's the second part of this first question. Is he enchanted by you? That's even stronger, and I want it to be stronger. Notice the end of the ninth verse. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the window, gazing through the lattice. Solomon has now gotten to Shulamite's house. And at first glance, it sounds like he's turned into a peeping Tom. <laughs> but that's not true. He's looking through the lattice into her home, trying to just get a glimpse of her, hoping to see her before she sees him. And Shulamite sees Solomon standing behind her wall, looking for her, trying to find her in his gaze. And this is the woman of his dreams. And in just a few days, they'll be married. You know, we take the blush off of marriage, don't we? We make it so sophisticated and so, so studious that we forget that it's supposed to be like this. It's supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be enchanting. Never apologize for that. That's the way God created it. It's the most exciting thing you can ever know in life, only to be topped one day by seeing the Lord Jesus Christ face to face and enter into a relationship for eternity in his presence. Question number two, does he speak tenderly to you? Notice in verses 10 through 14, we have this most amazing little soliloquy. Does he evidence his loyalty to you? Notice verses 10 and following. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Twice, Solomon speaks tenderly of his love for Shulamith. He calls her my love. He calls her my darling. He twice calls her beautiful, my fair one. Solomon didn't just assume that Shulamith knows how he feels. She just kept telling her over and over again. I have never heard of one time when a woman said to her husband at the end of the day, you have been way too sweet to me today. You've told me you love me too many times and you got to back off, honey. This is just not good. <laughs> that doesn't happen, does it? What does that mean? It means you can never tell the one you love too often how much you love them. You'll notice in this wonderful set of lyric poems. That's the genius of this whole thing, the communication between the two of these people. And then does he expose his life to you? Does he evidence his loyalty to you? Does he, does he say, you're mine and I'm yours and we're together and this is, this is great? And does he expose his life to you? And I think this is one of the most subtle things in this passage and I don't want you to miss it. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth and the time of singing has come and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. And the fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. <laughs> Solomon is speaking out of his great human love to his bride-to-be. And the thing that he knows and the thing that he knows to describe to her are the things that he has lived in and he has studied and he's a, he's a scientist and he loves the flowers and he loves the seasons and he loves the rain and he loves all of the things that are a part of nature and he incorporates those things into his statements to this woman. In essence, what he is doing is he is taking her and her life as a country girl from the hills of Lebanon and drawing her into his life, richly describing in detail everything that he knows will ultimately be meaningful to her. Does he evidence loyalty to you? Does he expose his life to you? Number C, 
does he express his love to you? Notice verse 14. Here's Solomon doing his scientific thing in expressing love. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Most people believe these words actually belong to Shulamith, but as I told you in the beginning, these are all kind of interchangeable, the way you describe yourself and your love to one another. Now, before we go on to the next paragraph in this story, I want to file one last report, if I can, on the importance of communication in marriage. And I want to remind you again that we came into this study on the Song of Solomon, all of us kind of worried this book is totally about sex, and there's sex in here, and we've touched on it some, and it gets a little steamier as we go along. But the vast majority of the book of the Song of Solomon is about the reality of love, and the reality of love, my friends, is not just sex. The reality of love is the communication process, the relationship that you develop between this person that God has called you to be with as your marriage partner. In the same ratio that you find intimacy in this book compared to everything else, that's about the normal relationship. So yes, work on the intimate part of your relationship, but don't forget in the process of doing that to work on the everyday relationship. There are so many couples who tell us they have almost no meaningful conversation during the day. It's all functional information, but there's no sharing of the details. There's no giving of one's heart, and that's what we have to work on if we're going to build strong marriages. Craig Clickman has written these words. One good indication of real love is the desire to communicate, a wish to discover all about this person whom you love so much. No detail seems too trivial to be related. No mood or feeling of one is unimportant to the other. And you care about the details and the feelings because you care so much about that person. And that which would be insignificant or boring to even a good friend is eagerly embraced with genuine interest by the one who loves you. The mere voice of that loved one is enchantingly special just in itself. One could read from the telephone book and the other would raptly listen just to hear the sound of her voice. I heard this week about someone, I don't know who this person is, who comes here, who lost a loved one this last year and refuses to erase the voicemail where her husband's voice is still heard. All oh, the voices of our loved ones and how precious they are to us. The summer before Don and I got engaged, I was traveling with a quartet all over the eastern part of the United States. There were five of us guys traveled representing Cedarville College. We were the college quartet, and we sang in different churches every night for the whole summer. We were able to earn some of our tuition doing that, and we just had a ball. You can't imagine how much fun that was. And Don and I were really serious. We were planning engagement and marriage, and I knew I wasn't going to see her very much. She went back to Cleveland to work. We knew we would not be with each other but maybe two or three times the whole summer. So we made a commitment. <laughs> we made a commitment that we write a letter to each other every single day. I think that was a lot easier for her to make a commitment to that than it was to me. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. We kept the commitment, and it was so interesting to me. I don't know how she ever did this, but she found out where I was going to be singing she got the itinerary, and it was so great because when I'd show up at the next church, the pastor would come and tell me, oh, there's some mail for you, and oh, yeah, I knew who that was from. Nobody wrote to me that whole summer but her. And when I got those letters, sometimes two or three would show up because you couldn't always gather, you know, sometimes they have to get forwarded. Before I would do anything else, before I'd help set up, before I'd unload the, the trailer, before I'd get, get to the host, I'd get those letters and find a quiet corner in the church and I'd open them up and I'd read them, not just once, I'd read them two or three times. And believe it or not, I still have all of them. You've heard the story, haven't you, about the little boy whose mother came home from work one day and she said, 
What have you been doing all day, honey? He said, well, Mom, I've been playing postman. Oh, she said, what, what did you do? He said, well, he said, Mommy, I found a whole bundle of letters in your closet wrapped up in a pink ribbon, and I delivered one of those letters to every house on our block. <laughs> So what I want to tell you folks is, I have all those letters, but they're in a safe place <laughs> where no one will ever find them but me. But once in a while, I pull one of them out and I read it, and I remember that she wanted to know every detail about every concert, and I wanted to know every detail about every day of work. Because when you're in love, you care about the details. Isn't that just a simple thought? So, guys, when, when you come home from work and your wife says to you, what did you do today? Share the details as much as you can. And maybe you have to wait a little bit until some of the emotional, if you had a bad day, maybe eat supper, you know, relax a little bit and then tell her. But, you know, there's hardly anything in our marriage that we, I don't know of anything that we don't share together. And that's what brings you together as a couple. Communication. Does he spend time with you does he speak tenderly to you? And probably I should say he or she because it goes either way. Number three, does he share trials with you? Verse 15, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now, you remember foxes, or sometimes referred to as jackals, were very much a part of the culture of that time. It was the little foxes that spoiled the crops. And metaphorically here in this text, the little foxes represent the little problems that creep into a marriage relationship and destroy it. Shulamith urges Solomon to be on guard against the little things that could destroy their love relationship. Chuck Swindoll has written, I'm convinced it's not the big things that weaken a marriage. On the contrary, big problems frequently strengthen marriages. The loss of a job, sudden illness, the death of a child, a long absence because of military service, these more than often deepen our love and enhance our relationship. It's the little things. It's the slow leaks, not the blowouts. <laughs> the insidious pests we seldom even consider that cut away at the heart of a home until it crumbles and two people end up walking away. I have to give you this testimony, and I think I speak for all of us here today. We can always handle the big stuff. But man, those little things that creep in, those little foxes. So don't be cocky. Don't say it can never happen to me. Be on guard against the little foxes that can destroy the vines. Number four, does he strengthen trust in you? My beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bether. This is all about oneness. Notice, my beloved is mine and I am his. Oneness in marriage. Unity out of singularity. Marriage, in my estimation, is like the unity candle displayed in so many marriages these days. If you've never seen it, let me tell you how it works. Three candles, two short ones on the outside representing the bride and the groom as individuals one taller one in the center representing their marriage. The three candles are placed at the front of the church. At a time early in the ceremony, someone lights the outside candles, leaving the one in the middle unlit. The two lit candles represent the bride and groom before the wedding. They walk into the church separately. They're still single. <laughs> The moment the bride and the groom say their vows before God, however, they're not single anymore. They're married. They're united. And the two become one. So after saying their vows, the husband and the wife approach the three candles. 
they take the individual candles from the outside, out of the holder, and together they bring them to the candle in the middle and they light the middle candle and they snuff out the candles that were lit in the first place. The symbolism is beautiful and it is obvious. No longer will their lights burn just for themselves alone. No longer will they live as two single people. Instead, they will enjoy one brighter light, a light that represents the oneness in their marriage. Oneness is the strength of marriage. It is the place where the couple becomes stronger than they could ever be by themselves. And when you understand marriage as God has given it to us in his word, it is the most wonderful thing because in marriage, one plus one doesn't add up to two. It adds up to four or five because two of you together are so much more powerful than you could ever be by yourselves. But you have to be one. I want to tell you something. The biggest adjustment you will ever have in your life is the adjustment of coming from your background and she from hers. It's one of the reasons why you need to ask all the questions you can before you get married. And in that moment when you become one, that oneness is the secret of what God has intended for you. It is what he had in mind when he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And he created marriage. And all through this series, I've been telling you that marriage, as wonderful as it is, is never truly complete until that marriage is complete in Christ. You may be here today having come here with your spouse or having been invited by a friend. While you're really, really excited about marriage, you've never put trust in Christ. So you're trying to do a divine thing in human strength. So let me go back to the candles again and give you one more picture, if you will. This is not about marriage. This is just about you and Almighty God. Take one of the side candles out. We don't need that because this is not two coming. This is just you. You can't know God as a couple. You have to know him individually. Here in the center is the tall candle. Here is your candle over here, the smaller one. In this ceremony, the tall candle is already lit. This is God. He is the light of the world. And the Bible tells us that Almighty God on a day in history bent down to light our candles for us and will only do it if we will lift up our candle and submit it to his light. And when we do, the light of Almighty God becomes the light of your life and my life. And now as a person connected with God through Jesus Christ, you bring so much more to your marriage, not just your humanity, but you bring the presence of the Holy Spirit and Almighty God living within your heart. And if you are blessed to have a partner like that, now you have something to really shout about. Oh, does that mean you won't have problems? Oh, no. It just means you've got an ally in the solution of the problems. Marriage is not for a Christian, two people coming together, as you remember from the triangle. Marriage is a three-dimensional affair. God is at the center, and we are joined together with one another and with him. We hope you've been encouraged by today's message from my new series, What the Bible Says About Love, Marriage, and Sex. Perhaps you're watching and you want to know more about the Bible, about God, or how you can have a personal relationship with him. That relationship can start today if you're willing to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you do that, God promised to make you into a new creation, to adopt you as his very own child, and to lead you all the days of your life. As you take this step of faith today, I want to encourage you to get in touch with a local church or a trustworthy ministry and let someone know who can help you grow in your newfound faith. Until then, may God bless you, and we'll see you next time right here on Turning Point.